Ryan, I mean, we can see there just one step city officials are taking to try and, you know, brace for what could be catastrophic flooding. Yeah, Tessa, and it's not just city officials that have went into making what they are estimating to be over 50,000 sandbags here. We're standing inside the San Miguel County uh, Public Works Yard right now, where work's been going on all day to create what they're hoping will save properties from potential dangerous floods, uh, especially the New Mexico National Guard. They've played a big role here. They've been activated by the governor, and about a 20-person crew here has been working throughout the day to put these sandbags together. They're estimating that there's 50,000 that they've put together and they suspect that they'll need more. Ryan Laughlin has been following the firefight all day in Berlin. So Ryan, where do we stand tonight? Tessa, how about some good news on the <laughs> wildfire fight tonight? Where I am standing right now is at the edge of the Bosque off Silva Road. Now that's important because Silva Road was the road that fire officials said they might have to evacuate later today. But I can tell you where I stand right now, with a big standing cottonwood in the Bosque behind me, with the temperature dropping, I can see the stars and the moon above me, which means there's no smoke here. This area was engulfed in smoke earlier, and now there's some optimism, cautious optimism from fire officials as we have some better conditions tonight. But still, it's been a harrowing couple of days for some and an exhausting couple of days for the people fighting to keep property safe. A little bit hectic out here. We just got a, a new a push alert on our phones. The mm -hmm. emergency alarm was going off, and now it says that there were no new evacuations in Mora County. That's new information we just got during Tamara's live shot there. Uh, but it's a, a fluid situation mm -hmm. here. The wind's brutal, and people are uh, are very worried about this growing fire. Ryan, you've been uh, covering this for every day for what three weeks now, uh, past two and a half weeks, I, I guess to be more precise. So uh, today. There was a lot, a, a star witness, you could argue, and also closing arguments. Yeah, and it was emotional. You know, mm -hmm. the state started with that disturbing police lapel camera yes. to really try to make an impact on the jury, showing that unspeakable scene inside the apartment. Meanwhile, the defense wanting the jury to take emotion out of the equation altogether. Well, the shock and despair of losing two public servants is really just beginning. The story of Harmio has told about getting kidnapped at knife point and leading to a high speed police chase. Well, that's a tale she's told before. We found two cases where Harmio has told police an almost identical story in grants, but both cases were initially dropped. Today, we asked the Cibola County Sheriff and the district attorney why. And the local TV news industry is small. Today we learned the name of the photographer injured. He got his start here at KOB4. His name is Jesse Walden. I worked with him, sometimes off the clock, as we tried to deliver stories that we thought would knock your socks off. Today we are all dealing with an array of emotions, from relief that our colleague is alive, to grief and anger that more than one family has been shattered number of very large wildfires threatening homes and livelihoods across our state. And this is just the start of what is shaping up to be a historic wildfire season in New Mexico. To the northeast part of our state, the largest wildfire in the country is burning. The combined Calf Canyon and Hermit's Peak fires is more than 145,000 acres. That's bigger than the entire city of Albuquerque. And while most of what is burned is in the forest, there's now a growing number of evacuees as the fire grows ever closer to homes. Everyone is anxiously watching to see what happens next, and we have Julie Friendack there in Las Vegas for that. Julie, you heard from the governor today. There's more help on the way, but we now know just how many New Mexicans are in need of this help. It was a question that took a lifetime to answer and a tragedy that shaped a family. After more than 60 years, some New Mexicans are finally getting answers to what happened to a precious four-year-old girl who vanished. Ryan Laughlin shows us how Little Miss Nobody finally became somebody. More than 60 years ago. That's where the abduction took place. A missing little girl. A distraught mother pleads for return of daughter. And across state lines, an unidentified body. Literally, it was a shock. A mystery that shaped the identity of a family. We were always that family who had their aunt kidnapped. This is the house that Sharon Lee Gallegos grew up in, and it was in this alley that she was abducted back in 1960, but no one knew what ever ended up happening to her. 
It's not something she wanted to talk about. Ray Chavez always wanted to know what happened to his Aunt Sharon. It's my mother's sister, and uh, my mother was the oldest in her family. His mother, Ramona Gallego Chavez, was with Sharon when she was taken. Well, it was the most painful memory of, from, of her life. Sharon's fate remained a mystery until a 2016 visit from a stranger. After she contacted my mom, my mom called me right away. I was still living in Alamogordo. She said this lady came to the door. I don't know who she is. She knows all about Sharon's kidnapping. An amateur cold case sleuth. Okay, let me see. I think I have it in my notes somewhere here. Who met with detective Mark Esqueda. She believes in her heart that uh, uh, a little girl that was found deceased in, in Arizona was was possibly Sharon the Gallegos. The girl found in Arizona, burned and buried off Highway 93, was known then and for 60 years since as a little Miss Nobody. I'm afraid you have very little to go on. After an old movie. I realize it isn't very hopeful. The girl's body was found just a couple weeks after Sharon was kidnapped. Investigators at the time ruled out a connection. However, armed with old newspaper articles. A search for kidnapped kidnappers continues. The picture says it all right there, you know. The old green car hunt still continues. The amateur sleuth had a different theory. It got Detective Escato's attention along with investigators in Arizona. Part of the process, of course, is getting DNA from family members. She said, I guess I can go give my DNA, you know. I will, I'll do that. That would be wonderful. You know how long we've been waiting? Right, right. Ugh. In this 2016 video, Ray's mom, Ramona, recalls for Detective Esqueto the days before someone took her baby sister. And there was a little tiny store that they used to have, like a oh, okay. mom and pa store. Oh, okay. And I send her for ketchup. Uh -huh. And she comes running back and she tells me, she tells me, Mona, I'm never going to the store again because this man was going to get me. Huh. No, you know, well, I maybe that's when we should have called the police. You get petrified. It's, it's so scary. But Ramona's DNA? It came back inconclusive. Ramona died the very next year. They went to their grave not knowing. I, I wish his mother was still alive because you know, she's no longer with us and she would like to get the news of that. It wasn't until Chavez's uncle submitted his DNA that led to last month's announcement in Yavapai County, Arizona. Little Miss Nobody had a name. Sharon Lee Gallegos was abducted July 21st, 1960. You know, my sister started bawling, <laughs> my, my brother, we were holding it together as best as we could. Little Miss Nobody became somebody. That gave us the answer that we were looking for. Closure for a tormented family is far from a happy ending. You know, you're thinking, oh man, my aunt got murdered. You know, that just breaks your heart. Why would you do that to a four and a half year old? Chavez says his family is satisfied, finally knowing what happened to Sharon. But questions remain. Investigators in Arizona who kept pursuing justice for Little Miss Nobody say they will keep pursuing justice for Sharon. I had a one-on-one -on -one with a cold case. They are not gonna stop. They are gonna continue to look. His greatest pain comes when he thinks about his mom, the pain she experienced all her life, and the pain she shared with Detective Esqueto six years ago. You think you forget, but it comes right back to you. <laughs> I mean, you never forget, but right. you kind of like, like put it on the side, you know. Those close to Chavez tell him. You know what, Ray? Your mother and your grandmother would be proud of what you were doing. <laughs> so, <sighs> that made me feel good. I hadn't thought of that. A lot can change in 60 years. Headlines, memories, even family. For the people that are out there who have lost somebody, don't give up hope. Don't give up hope. But hope remains. Ryan Laughlin for Investigates. There is a local restaurant that definitely catches your eye when you drive or walk by, but have you ever wondered about the story behind it? Ryan Laughlin shares why it truly demonstrates the heart of New Mexico. 
this unusual restaurant. The Michael's restaurant is a different kind of restaurant. Comes alive every Tuesday night. It's jazz night at Ben Michael's. As we welcome to the stage Hayden to sing. And Ben Michael does it all. Wash the dishes. <laughs> I like it all. Because it starts from mopping, to washing dishes, to cooking food. And you guys know, people show up, I'm the waiter, and then after I finish waiting, then I go cook their food, bring out your food, and after that I try to play them some music. But this wasn't always the plan. People come in here and you kind of like, you just don't sit down and eat, you sit down and you talk to your neighbor. Before the music, dancing, and food, there was another plan. When I went to college, I wanted, actually wanted to be an architect. A professor came up to me and says, you're, you're not smart enough to be an architect. And kind of like blew my bush in my bubble, dude. I was like, really, dude? He became a pharmacist. But he always had a passion for people. Back in the day, he would say, let your food be your medicine, and your medicine be your food. <laughs> and so I took that aspect to heart. His dad knew a lot about feeding a neighborhood. My father had a grocery store. It was uh, right across street from the South Broadway Cultural Center. It was called Ben's Food Market. The building is still there. It opened as a grocery store in the Borellis neighborhood in 1956. So I got to grow up in that business of, of, of a grocery business and, and meeting people and, and getting to know your neighbors. Your neighbors would come in and they'd all come in and they'd share. and. Sometimes neighbors would come in and bring my dad a six pack of beer and they'd share a beer and how you doing? Bringing a community together runs in the family. However, this particular jazz night was right before coronavirus changed our world forever. I realized that how fragile we all are. Jazz nights stopped. I learned a sense of appreciation and humility of uh, how important that really is for all of us. Ben Michaels sat empty for months. We as a human race need each other. We all need a touch, we need a love, we need kindness, we need to interact with each other. But a change of plans would not change his mission. And like, I remember my dad always told me growing up is, he would kind of let me do what I want to do, he said, but he always said, but Michael, don't embarrass your family do right with your family. This restaurant? My dad, actually, when I first opened up, my dad was my first dishwasher. And then my mom was my waitress. Was built brick by brick. No architecture degree needed. It's a building that I built uh, about 29 years ago. Made 8,000 adobe bricks. Um, made all the doors, carved all the beams, went to the mountains, cut all the aspens down. Every detail was crafted by the tools he got from his family. This is my grandfather's draw blade. A draw blade is what you use to peel bark off a, off a, a tree. So when you want to put vegas up or so I, I'm real proud of it because this is the only tool I got from him. Building a business and a community. Thank you for coming tonight. We'll come back. Yeah, she's a good person. See you next week. The way his father did. I hope my dad really was proud of me. I hope he you know, loved me. And, was, and my mom said, yeah, he did. And it was just a soft-spoken way what he did. Ben Michael's dad died 10 years ago. My father was a good, funny man, you know. Um, he was really loved. But he's not gone. On the wall Ben Michael built hangs a picture. His community, his father, and the family before him. I look at the, the wall and I go, man, I hope I make you guys proud, you know, you guys, and I hope you're enjoying the music tonight, you know, from heaven. Now his community has returned, helping him keep the doors open. Tuesday night jazz nights look like they always did. It's really neat because I've continued, to, by the grace of God, to continue to have a business and to uh, 
offer probably the same things they wanted to offer to people and that they probably did offer to people and to continue that same sense of small business but big heart. Showing a change of plans doesn't always mean a change of course. With this Heart of New Mexico, I'm Ryan Laughlin, KOB4.